Hi, good morning, and welcome to um, ZP Developer Zone. So every week um, we do a live um, webinar specifically for the members of our ZP Developer Zone. Um, I do hope that my um, audio is coming through um, well enough for you this morning. I swapped computers at the last minute, but I will go ahead and assume that um, everything is good. And if it's not, just let me know in the chat. All right, cool. So today is, I say to you, the 5th of August, but that's actually um, not true. It's the 19th of August. But um, today is, you know, our 8 a.m. Um, live streaming webinar for our ZP Developer Zone members. Um, and every week, you know, I put this kind of slide up and say, you know, we at, Z, at Zimmer and Peacock, you know, we have this, um, yeah, hi, Ali. Um, that we have this um, live streaming webinar and, you know, as part of the ZP Developer Zone, we have the Academy, we have this um, webinar, we do um, collaborations um, with people from around the world. Um, now, specifically, this webinar is um, driven by um, people um, asking questions on our um, forum. And so, you know, every week I kind of, if we get questions in from the ZP Developer Zone members, I ask them to put those questions on the forum and um, then we kind of respond to them here. But it's also worth saying that the forum is also very active with uh, members of the ZP Developer Zone also posting, you know, comments and stuff like that on the... On, on the... Uh, Ali's saying that the quality of the voice is a bit different today. Yeah, so I apologise for that, Ali. I've had a, um, a last-minute um, computer change and um yeah i'll get this fixed but I, I did change computers at the last minute but thank you for the feedback i do appreciate it so i will fix this for um, later on today um but so what i want to say is um today we had some questions in um one of them was somebody wants to use a ph sensor hi hitcham somebody wants to use a ph sensor maybe as part of wound healing so we'll answer that um one of our um, ZP Developer Zone members was asking a question. Um, hi, Ritu. And one of our um, members was asking, if I change the flow rate in a flow cell, how will that affect my electrochemical biosensor? So that's quite a technical question. That's quite good. We've also got some nice comments from Ali about the use of augmented reality in biosensing. So um, in the vlog, on Sunday, I met, I was talking to Ali and Aftab, and um, Ali um, gave me some nice comments about the use of augmented reality in educating around biosensors. I thought those were quite nice comments and um, something we'll probably implement. And then we also got some questions in about um, CGM, continuous glucose monitoring, and um, microneedles. So as Ali, as Ali's commented, hopefully the audio is not too bad. I did a last minute um, essentially PC change and um, I'm not using the same kind of microphone but we have to we have to go on these are live streaming um, and we always I think since we sort of promised in something like 2000 possibly even 2019 that we would do these live streaming we've never missed one so you know the show must go on as they say um, so one of the questions that came in was you know look we're interested in measuring you know sensors for wounds on humans and they want to operate at 36 to 37 degrees C. Um, and then they kind of have a specification and the specification is kind of the pH range that they're interested in. Maybe um, is it um, it's two to 10, which we can discuss. They want their resolution to be about, well, they say resolution here that I, um, that sensitivity is 60 millivolts per pH. The accuracy is plus or minus 15 millivolts. I suspect that they're really referring to pH here because the, that kind of accuracy is really driven by the electronics. Um, then they mentioned temperature again. They mentioned temperature coefficient. Now, Zero and Peacock, we do have temperature um, chambers and we do put our biosensors into those chambers. And um, we have some data on our website about glucose sensors, you know, how glucose sensors are actually quite sensitive to temperature. And I think it's because they're enzyme based. The pH sensor sensors don't have um, obviously enzymes in them, um, but they are temperature sensitive. We just haven't um, 
characterized it, but we are capable of characterizing, but we haven't. So um, I don't know what our temperature coefficient is, um, but I was, you know, somebody essentially is going to have to measure it if they want to use it um, or wouldn't want to know it. Um, they give some dimensions, they give some weight. So this person is interested in, um, or this ZP developers or members interested in um, essentially using pH to measure probably wounds. Um, I think the two biomarkers that are kind of recognized for wound tracking are, I think, uric acid and pH. And I mean, uric acid and pH essentially is this, you know, they're the same thing in some ways, you know, that, you know, if you've got a wound and I believe the uric acid concentration changes and therefore the pH changes, but it's probably sometimes simpler to um, measure pH. So we do have a uric acid um, sensor as well. But anyway, on with the, the first thing is, I mean, um, the pH sensor that I would recommend for this is the um, hypervalue pH sensor. I recommend it because it works and it's got the best kind of pricing. Now, at Zimmer and Peacock, we're really focused on people getting to market. So, you know, when I sort of say here, like, you know, 10 pH sensors from ZP is 20 euros each, but 100,000 is 2 euros each, and then 1 million is 99 cents each. This is just our way of explaining that, you know, as much as we support R&D, we've always got our mind on, you know, what's this going to cost when you really go to market? I think in wound care, this kind of, you know, the, the cost of wound care in, you know, in Europe is really expensive. You know, like a foot ulcer or a diabetic costs thousands of pounds, I suspect, a year to take care of. So these kind of pricing is nothing compared to the cost of the actual, let's say, problem that we're talking about here. But anyway, these are the pH sensors that I recommend. Now, you do have some very specific technical questions, so I have to sort of... Um, oh, that's interesting. Uh, I think I'm just going to go up slightly. Yeah, I think I've actually brought up the wrong um, presentation. I got no, I, I can't have brought up the wrong presentation. But yeah, I was. I apologize because I was actually going to show you some. Um, no, I really think I might have actually brought up the wrong presentation. But um, let me just give me a second while I uh, just check something. I will be quick. Hopefully. Um, yes, let me just. I don't know even how I made it, managed to make that mistake. Um, but anyway, here I go. Yeah, so I made, I made a little bit of a mistake there, but um, I rectified it. So just go very quickly. So we did, um, I, I just want to add as well, actually, it's just a small, small bit of news. And um, we're going to do a webinar um, at 3.30, essentially IST. Um, this is time in India. We're doing a small webinar. Sorry, I've just come off topic slightly, but we're doing a small webinar um, with Amity University in India this um, afternoon um, at, um, as I say, 3.30. I'll try and put the link uh, underneath the video down below because it might be a bit hard to actually find the link to this, but it is open to the public and it will be with um, AFTAP, who's a member of the ZP Developer Zone, is one of the organizers. I'll be speaking and there'll also be a guy called um, Eric Johansson um, speaking as well. We do get some questions sometimes about how to join Zimmer and Peacock and I often steer people towards Eric in um, or Professor Johansson in Norway because He's essentially the local professor at the university where we are. So he's a good way into us because people postdoc with him or do a PhD with him or do a master's with him. And then, you know, from there, they can trans transition over to Zimmer Peacock. So anyway, so I sort of back up slightly and then get back into the actual um, presentation. Um, so we do, we do get a lot of these kind of questions about, you know, somebody wants to measure pH, the effect of um, flow on biosensors, some comments from Ali, and also some CGM questions. Yeah, this is what I was looking for. So I just want to answer the specific question. The person wants to understand, you know, can these pH sensors work between a range of 2 and 10? Ali and Aftab know this. Uh, yes, these sensors, we, we test them at, this is data off our website. Here we test them at a pH of 2 to 9. 
and then back from nine to two and then down again. So we have that kind of data and this on this particular piece of data, we're, we're testing at a pH of 9.95. So yeah, the sensors have that kind of range. The sensitivity, they call it resolution, but the sensitivity that we measure here is 51 millivolts per pH. The theoretical, as Ali will know, is 59 millivolts per pH. We get 51. So for an industrial electrochemist, I mean, for me, it's more than adequate. So I would recommend um, the hypervalue pH sensors in that kind of application. And I recommend them because the pricing is pretty good and it should be able to fit high Santosh um, and the pricing should be able to fit the final application as I say um, to dress a foot ulcer I think in the in the in Europe costs about in materials about 150 euros so the kind of pricing you know per sensor here just makes complete sense in that um, application market now on electronics um, I'm really suggesting this because we really dropped the price on this um, on this particular um, piece of electronics. We dropped it down to 250 euros. So the reason I, 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 I highlight that is because once upon a time to make a or even to get started on a wearable biosensor project, like you know, a wearable pH sensor, the pH sensors that were wearable, just not available, but they are available now. You can get like, you know, ZP, we're always trying to, you know, crush the pricing. So we're doing like, you know, 10 of them at 20 euros each. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like what Ali say, very good correlation with theoretical value indeed. Yeah, he's talking about the pH data, I agree. Um, but we have a very low cost electronics, it means 250 euros. So I appreciate depending on the region, you know, that's expensive or not. But I think in terms of commercially available electronics, that's probably the lowest cost at the moment. And we also have quite a nice video online as well about, you know, where, Sol Run, one of our engineers, um, actually measures pH using one of our um, hypervalue screen printed electrodes, which has been functionized for pH and also um, this board as well. So I think we have quite a nice um, little package for people who want to measure pH. Um, I'm going to move to the next technical question now, which was um, how does flow, here it comes here, how does flow rate change the signal during biosensing? So just as interest, um, on the ZP developer zone, we have some downloadable, printable, downloadable, printable 3D files. So you can download these files and you can print a 3D flow cell. These are free to anyone who's a member of the ZP developer zone. Just contact me. Um, you know, and if you're a member of the ZP developer zone, we'll give you, I think they're called STL files and you can, basically 3D print your own flow cell. So the ZP developer zone member, he has some biosensors from us and he's downloaded the 3D printable biosensors, I would say 3D printable flow cell. So the flow cell will allow him to essentially flow a liquid over the top of the um, screen printed electrode. Now, um, the question he's asking is how will flow rate affect signal? So I've brought up a fairly useful equation here. I mean, this is, you know, this, this equation says that the, um, the current that you measure in a mass transport limited system. So by mass transported, what I mean by that is if you're stirring, you're generally doing forced um, convection. So that's you're controlling the mass transport. If you're flowing, you're controlling the mass transport. So in a mass transport sort of limited um um, application the current is off is often proportional to the number of electrons the area of the electrode faraday's constant the mass transport and the concentration so this scientist question is is how does mass transport or how does flow rate um, affect the signal so when you look at this equation current is equal to n n is a constant it's the number of electrons involved in the process there's also A. A is a constant because it's also the because it's the area of the electrode. And F is a constant because it's Faraday's constant, which I think is something like 96485 coulombs per mole. The, the next form of the equation I show is I brought all the constants together, the N, the A, and the F. So I just said I is equal to constant times mass transport times C. What this equation tells you is 
if you want to measure C, which is what you do in biosensing, you know, you want to know the concentration, it means you're going to have to control the flow rate or know the flow rate, because you can always compensate if the flow rate is varying. But it does say, you know, if you flow at one mil per minute, and then you flow at half a mil per minute, you would theoretically decrease the signal by half. So what this says is, in many situations, your current is proportional to your flow rate times your concentration. So in order to accurately know concentration, you're going to have to control flow rate. Or if you can't control it, you can measure it. If some pumps, they'll have a pulsation, you know, that sort of pump, and then it'll get a bit slower, and then it pump, pump, pumps. So you have pulsation. In that case, you will see it in the current because every time it pulses, the pump pulses, you'll see a jump, 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 jump. But it's actually, you know, this is not a problem as long as you know it and you can compensate for it. So the quick answer to your question is, um, if you have a flow rate of one, then your signal is proportional to that. If you have a flow rate of half, then your signal will then be half of it. If it's a quarter, it'll be a quarter of it. So the quick answer is um, control your flow rate, otherwise it will be part of your signal. So now the next question, I'm just checking the time. All right, yeah, the time is um, just quarter past. So um, it, was about the, it was about this easy flex and micro needles. Um, if you're attending the Amity um, um, webinar, as I say, which is on um, this afternoon at 3.30 um, Indian time, then we'll, we'll cover micro needles a bit more there. But the question, the questions were, um, whoops, a daisy. Um, if we get micro needles and the EZ flex, how is it going to be used? So I'll try and explain that on the next slide. I put a red arrow here because the question is, is can we, are we able to write to program this? This EZ flex is based on a chip from um, TI instruments called the LMP9000. So we have written a little program for it, but we have not written the firmware for the LMP9000. You can find all the instructions on how to program this chip online from Texas Instruments. So the, the reason I put a red arrow there is whether you can do it or not depends essentially on your skill um, and the skill of your engineers. So it's open source. It's provided by Texas Instruments. We give some of our software to kind of, you know, allow you to kind of access it. But... It's really based on the skills of your engineers, whether you can program that chip or not. Um, the question here is, uh, can I put the micro needles on my skin? Uh, and if so, how long will they, will they stay with the sensor patched? So we provide these micro needles in order to allow people to accelerate their development, you know, so that they can start thinking about their application. We are not selling these micro needles as a medical product that's been like FDA approved or, you know, so... The quick disclaimer is, I cannot approve you putting them on your skin. I will put them on my skin. That's my choice, you know, and I, you know, and I, and I have to do my own risk assessment. But I cannot authorize other people to do the same, because in order to turn it into a medical device, um, it's it, you're building a glucose system. So what this is, this allows you to do your prototyping, your early development, but your glucose system that you want to develop, that has to be, um, you know, approved, obviously, in, you know, in your, in, at least in your own country. But then, you know, if you want to sell it in the US by the FDA, and if you want to sell it um, in Europe, then you have to get CE marked. So we are provide these micro needles in order that people can start doing prototyping and development. But I can't sit here and approve that you stick those into your skin. I will. But that's my choice as an individual. Um, but I will not, uh, you know, recommend or even encourage in any way that you do that. Um, so just to say, because otherwise, you know, we, 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 that would be saying that we're selling them as a, a medical product for to be good use on patients. And that's not what we're doing. We, we're providing them as essentially for tools so that engineers who are interested in things like AI and app development and want to develop technologies for diabetics can get a flying start on this. The next question is, um, does it have a transmitter? It does have Bluetooth connection. If you look at the web page, um, there's videos all about, 
regarding that. So it does have Bluetooth connectivity, that easy flex. Um, you don't need to make your own transmitter. It's on the, the board. Um, so their, their goals are this. They want to be able to program it themselves. Um, so that really is down to the skill set of the engineers. And um, I could not approve you putting them on your skin and using them. I would do it for myself, but that's a personal choice and I would have to take the risk assessment. Because essentially um, what the technologies on the ZP web store allow you to do is, you know, get some electronics so you can start developing, get some um, micro needles so you can start developing and you can start, you know, developing and testing. But there is a phase where your business or whatever you're doing, you, you have to become, you know, somehow not you have to be, but you have to be involved in an ISO 13485 quality system where all the risk assessments have taken place, where you've checked sterility, um, etc. So these are just the start of your journey, I would say. So this is the easy flex with the micro needles and plugged into it. So there's a connector here. So you can literally just unplug um, the micro needles. They plug in and out. Um, so so that essentially you kind of get the board and then you just plug um, the micro needles in. Um, you can also just put other our other glucose um, electrodes in there as well. So um, I don't know how to describe, but there are some videos of of, of us doing this kind of testing with easy flex but it's fairly straightforward to do you kind of get this board you make bluetooth connection with it the bluetooth aerial is actually this little um little dot here um and you put the sensor into the connector and then this this end here will have to go into the glucose solution or these micro needles here what we do is we often test these kind of things on um animal skin that we get from the abattoir you know, we'll sort of get a Petri dish, fill it full of glucose and then put the micro needles into the skin um, and essentially test the micro needles that way. Um, so that's sort of one way of getting going with um, this. Now, I would say this, we do have a lot of PDFs regarding this EasyFlex on our website. And also, if people have questions regarding EasyFlex, which I'm trying to do today, you know, we'll also answer those questions through the developer zone as well. So the next thing I'm going to do um, is a quick demo. Yeah. Now, Ali and Aftab saw this demo, so but I just thought this was kind of cool. Um, and we didn't have time last week to show it. But I'm very interested um, in, and here it is here. This is augmented um, reality. Um, what it allows you to do is essentially view an object using your smartphone, and then it's... Um, doing a little um, sort of animation on top of it. So you can essentially here, we're just showing that we've labeled the counter electrode, the working electrode and the reference electrode, and it shows you how to connect that into the connector. So I think that's pretty cool. But I, what I was really uh, intrigued by was, um, I asked in the in the blog um, to Ali and Aftab, I said, oh, you know, what, what do you think about um, what can we do with this? And I think Ali came up with a really nice um, thought, actually, um, which was really about the educational value of this. We can actually take a kind of um, like a glucose sensor um, and make an augmented reality, essentially, app around it so that you could see the, you know, you can see all the layers on the glucose sensor and maybe get some training about how the glucose sensor works. So I thought that was kind of nice, you know, that you know, augmented reality looks cool, but the question is, is, you know, what can we use it for to make, you know, to add value to people's experience? And I thought the idea that, you know, something like a glucose sensor is fairly complicated. It's not clear when you look at a glucose sensor, you know, how it works, you know, how it's constructed. So we could make augmented reality around that. So I thought that was a nice place to start. So I do appreciate um, the thoughts around that. Just for fun, um, I sometimes show um, the development of this particular little device. So I'll I'll, fi I'll finish up now. I'll just check the time. Yeah, eight twenty-four. So, how small can electronics and biosensors get? This is a um, a little board that I've shown on occasions. We've now encapsulated it, so you can see that this. It, oh, let me let me let me go through it. So what we have is we have a. Um, 
a little wire. The wire terminates with the biosensor. So the biosensor is literally a tiny exposed tip of this platinum wire. That's interesting. Cool. I was just making sure that that yeah. I'm 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 hoping that the sound is still coming to you. Like I say, um, I'm not on the best computer today. I realized I had to quickly change computers. But what we you know, I'm just showing you a bit of an update that this is kind of you know this is why electrochemistry and biosense is so kind of cool that we can actually make this tiny little package. It's only twenty millimeters long. We have a wire coming out of it that terminates on a biosensor. The power is in there, the electronics are in there, and the transmitter is in there as well. So it's kind of, you know, almost like a yeah, 20 millimeter little capsule like that. Um, this one's intended to get implanted into fish, but it just gives you a sense of, you know, the, the compactness um, that you can make with um, this kind of stuff. Um, so I was going to summarize, but I realize I've left out an important part of the summary. So I appreciate the questions um, regarding the easy flex. I appreciate the comments from Ali about how we could use augmented reality. Um, cool. Just making sure. Um, I also appreciate the um, the question about um, flow on biosensing. So the quick the quick summary there is: if you double the flow rate, you'll probably double the current. So you need to control that flow rate and if you're going to do pH sensing in the wound, get those hypervalues um, pH sensors and get that board because the cost of the sensors plus board is less than 500 euros. I think it's probably the best place to start. And then I need to shoot all the way to the top again now. Um, but I just want to mention that at 3.30 India time, um, one of our key um, members of the ZP developers has a, what we're going to do.